think we kind of have an issue. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, yeah, so yeah, I guess we'll just kick off the session. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Zero to One No Code Workshop. I'm your host, Shamsa Mohammed, Venture Partner at the Barbab Network. And today we have an exciting session planned for you. The workshop is specifically designed for dynamic founders like yourself who aim to streamline the product uh, development cycle, uh, rapidly test business ideas, and significantly reduce the cost and time traditionally involved in software development. So before we get started, here's a bit about the Barbab Network. Although I know you're mostly familiar with us and what we do, for those who don't, uh, the Barbab Network is an accelerator for early stage tech startups in Africa. Since investing in 2019, we have a portfolio of 40 tech-enabled startups from across the continent, representing 14 different African countries and 11 different sectors. So the Barbab Network is more than accel accelerated. It's a global community of innovators, mentors, investors committed to powering growth in the continent, and most importantly, supporting the incredible African founders who provide resources, mentorship, and long-term capital uh, for founders who need to achieve scale and growth while still maintaining resilience in this ever uh, uh, changing times. So that said, let us learn a bit ab about our partner today. We've partnered, we've partnered with Mohara. They are a venture studio with over 100 builders spread across UK, Canada, South Africa, Thailand, Mexico, and Philippines. Uh, they specialize in supporting founders in the journey from idea to series A, bringing their product ideas into reality and then iterating alongside founders in the journey to product market fit. So before we dive, deep dive into the workshop, let's quickly go over the agenda for today. And joining me today is Luke, Accelerator Partnerships Lead at Mohara, who will give us an overview of what's in store for us today. Uh, over to you, Luke. Great, thanks very much, Shamsa. Just a quick one, I think we're very excited to be uh, here today presenting to this group. You know, it's our entire mission to bring good ideas to life, um, and we specialize in the early stage, so that whole journey from pre-seed to series A. Part of what that means is that we need to be ready to support founders in what I sometimes refer to as fit for stage build, and today we'll be sharing some of our learnings relevant to the earliest stages of that. Um, Rich, our CEO, CEO, is here today. He's going to be talking to us about validation. So uh, Rich leads us with decades of technology experience and experience mentoring founders, either directly or through entrepreneurial support organizations like the New Entrepreneurs Foundation in the UK. Tom, uh, after Rich takes us through validation, Tom will be taking us through zero to one, which uh, and he'll touch on some no-code toolings within that. He's a former founder and head of Mahara Zero to One. He's previously been through programs like Antler and now specializes in getting founders through from idea to product with smart lean experiments. And of course, there'll be time for questions at the end. So I think with that, over to you, Rich. Super. Thank you very much, Luke. I want to bottle that. I absolutely want to bottle the way that you just introduced everybody there. We sound great, don't we? Yeah, we sound. We... No pressure, no pressure. Right. Okay. Let's, um, let's get my desktop shared. Um... Super. We're in. Made it. Just because you run a technology company doesn't mean you necessarily know everything. Um, well, listen, thank you very much for allowing us to come and speak to you all today. I think it's always a great pleasure and a, a wonderful thing for the soul to be able to come and speak to new founders and people that are just beginning their journey um, and hopefully imparting some knowledge and to help you along your way. These are these are designed as your sessions. You know, we absolutely want to make sure that this is not just Tom and I talking about experiences or ideas that we've got, but it is, you know, very much designed to for you to, to comment, to raise hands and to obviously at the end ask questions as well. So if you want to load any questions into the chat along the way, please do so. If you've got something that comes across your mind, um, and we'll make sure that we get to those uh, get to those points. So, um, just a little bit of introduction. So, Tom, I mean, Luke touched on it. Um, I founded, co-founded um, Mahara in 2016 with my good friend and business partner Ben, and we've been working for over 12 years independently in, in startups. Mahara itself was invested in 35, so we've had a good understanding of what a good what, good understanding of what a great founder looks like and what a validated idea looks like um, before taking the jump to invest. And Tom's come on and is is leading out our our zero to one function with a heavy um, 
heavy experience in building out no-code tools and rapid prototyping. It's got himself a tremendous amount of experience in validation as well. So what I'm going to be taking you through uh, on this uh, presentation um, is why are we here? Um, so just go back up to here. So why are we here? A little bit of background about how we do validation. Um, the idea of what a waitlist is, the master plan, and then resources, and then over to Tom. I'm mindful of time. I've definitely taken this presentation to over 30 minutes at one point, and I need to give Tom enough time, and I need to give time for, for some uh, questions as well. So I'm going to move through um, at a fair pace, but if there are any questions, do feel free to bung them into the chat. Okay. So why are we here? Ultimately, we want to help you build the best technology startups that we can you know, empowering you, the pioneers, the people that are willing to go out and put yourself out there with your idea, work hard, blood, sweat and tears and all the rest of it to kind of get your ideas moving forward. Um, we know that takes a tremendous amount of courage. We know it's a very challenging journey, a tremendously fulfilling one, um, but a challenging journey in that. Mahar exists and we exist to be able to support you along your way, whether we work directly with you or indirectly by supporting networks like uh, Um We believe that every good idea has got a chance to shine. Um, and we think that the things that particularly Tom will talk through here removes barriers and lowers barriers for being able to get ideas and products out to market. You know, gone are the days where you used to be able to have to spend three to six months to build out an MVP or a product to get it to market. You know, we're seeing products anywhere from two to six weeks, you know, which is a fantastic way to hopefully have those good ideas shine. Um, we believe you as non-technical founders, ex, uh, apologies if there are any technical people in the, in the crowd today, but non-technical founders have got great potential and I think have been historically restricted um, by what you've been able to do because of the, those barriers to entry for building great products. Um, we feel ourselves that there is a better way to build early stage tech companies. That's why we founded a venture studio that is very much directed at working closely with founders with aligned incentives and with the with the move to zero to one, which is the earlier stage, as Luke says, fit for stage part of our business. Um, we're really excited about, you know, imparting knowledge and potentially collaborating with people. So that's our why, that's the reason why we're here today. So a little bit of background. Okay, so we, on our validation part of our business, we've all got independent experience of how we go about doing validation. And this is something that we have done over a number of years. Let me just collapse this. There we go. Over a number of years. Um, but we've we've landed on partnering with good friends of mine and a company that have been specifically validating early stage businesses with their um, with their recipe, as they call it, for a number of years. And they're called who they're called Who's Fabio. Um, I've got a link to their book at the end of this deck, when of course this deck will be shared with you. So you can download their book and it's a, a great introduction to how they go about simplifying and making sure that ideas and, and founders stay focused. So who's Fabio represent the, the, I guess, the functional team that sit with inside of our zero to one, almost pre-accelerator. So before you're thinking about building. And what I wanted to do today is to take you through some of the processes that they use um, and that what we use with inside of Mahara to help, um, help founders validate their ideas and, and to make sure that you are sense checking that, you're not building anything or not putting your time into something that necessarily won't um, won't bear fruit. So I just wanted to introduce you to Fabio. Like I say, there's a link for the book at the end, and I would definitely recommend that all of you download it. It's a pretty easy read um, to get through, um, and I think it, it goes into it goes into a tremendous amount of detail about some of the things I'm about to go through. Okay, so this is what it's rooted on: the 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 Who's Fabio recipe and the way that Mahara validates. Now, some of this is fairly standardised. You know, you will think if you're thinking about a venture studio, you think, right, well, first off, I've got to validate the idea. Then I've got to go and pilot it. And then I've got to go and get, um, I've got to go and get some form of iteration. I've got to go and qualify this. So who's Fabio's three gateways are a wait list, a master plan, and then a pilot. And that pilot is where Tom comes in. So I'm really focusing on that one and two. So with the wait list is, essentially what it says in the tin how can you sort out your unique value proposition and the position that you've got and be able to go and validate that in a tremendously low cost rapid way building a wait list is obviously a group of people a group of potential early adopters that are interested in your product and this is a tremendously strong and simple indicator not the only indicator but a simple indicator at the beginning of your journey to say 
This proves that there is a market. This proves that people are interested in this product. So building a wait list is the first piece. And then turning your plan into a market leading startup is the master plan. How are you actually going to do it? And then pilot is working on that product pilot with robust user retention and also thinking about what we do when it comes to iterating. So three gateways, wait list, master plan, pilot. This is the process we follow. Okay, so the wait list. Okay, this is key because it indicates to investors the market need. Um, you may see a lot, and I'm sure you discuss this here about becoming investor ready. Now, when you get early stage investment from an angel investor or, or any kind of financial network, a lot of it is about story. And a lot of it is about your ability to tell a story about what this business could be. Because at this stage, a lot of the time people buy people. Um, but what really, really helps is if you are a person that can as a vision and you'll be able to talk to that story, but you've actually got some indicators that give that investor confidence that you're going to be able to be well operating in a market that there is a need. Um, so are the real people struggling with the problem that you're trying to solve? Does your value proposition, is it compelling enough for them want to actually try it? Or are they, you know, so what, don't really care. You know, these are big questions that you've got to answer by having a wait list. Okay, so how the, how the process formulates a wait list is, Determining the value proposition. So this is through an SMS pitch. So this is, you know, 162 characters. 160 characters? It's 160. It might be 162. Um, and this is about who it's for, what's the outcome, what's the struggle, you know, the problem that people are wrestling with, and what's the secret source, what's the defining unique value proposition um, there. It's about testing it, testing and iterating that SMS pitch to see if you can get 90% of your people to say, yeah, I'm interested in that. Then you're going to be building a landing page, very straightforward, get it spun up in Wix, somewhere under four hours. And then the idea is that you've got to get people to commit to that idea. Now, what you'll notice across all of this is it's really lightweight because you're not going to get it right the first time through. I mean, you may be, you might be one of those people that just absolutely have a true understanding of the market and you nail it first time out. But the, the, the high chances are you're just not going to be able to. So it's about understanding that SMS and really dialing in. What is this thing? What is this thing that I'm going to do? Who for? What's the outcome? What's the struggle? What's the special bit that separates it from the market? Be able to test and iterate that so you can get your people to say, yes, this is going out to early adopters. This is going out to find a, an audience that you can go and test this with. And then you want them to go and submit their email. You want them to go and submit their telephone number so that they're there for news. And then you can cultivate that list as you go. If you can't get though, people to commit to wanting to find out more about your product, then you've most likely got a product that people don't really care about. If you understand the market you're going to, you understand your customer type and you're going out to talk to them and they're not really interested, it's time to pivot. It's time to look at that value proposition. But the way this is built is you're doing it without extensive build you're not putting loads of money into this this is done by founders and founders on their own pretty much you know everybody should be able just to do this on their own the building that way this is a massive lightweight integral indicator as to whether you're sitting on something that there's a real market need for okay so on the value prop i'll just put some things in here so this is the the fms pitch the reason is simplifying and focusing on your value prop so so you can, you, they used to call it the elevator pitch, um, but the elevator pitch is, you know, the 30 seconds it takes to go up the elevator, but you're highly likely going to be sharing this pitch. So it's done to 160 characters. Uh, who is the super user? Um, simplify some focus on a smaller set of user needs. So describe the person who's most desperately looking for the solution. You know, who has their hair on fire? It's obviously not me, but who has their hair on fire and what the common characteristics of that person are. Um, make sure there is no defined outcome so you cannot define a solution. The purpose of your product is to help your customers get something done. Can you articulate what it is in your case? What are you helping them get done? What's the outcome of them using your product? Um, the struggle. Now, this is an interesting one. Strugglers don't know how, strugglers only know how to do things in the wrong way. The truth is that they don't know the steps to follow and they don't know whether their ideas will actually yield a better result, but masters do. So try to talk to people who understand how to do what you're doing correctly. So you're not going to people who don't have an understanding saying, well, does this work for you? Because they're, they're ill informed. They don't know. But if you're trying to revolutionize, I don't know, the ball, the ball bearing industry, go and talk to someone about the ball bearing industry and understand whether your product fits because they're the masters of that industry. And that's a very interesting flip that I think a lot of founders don't, don't see. And then the, 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 the secret source is this, this independent thing. How can, what, what is it that you're building that will help that struggler turn into a master? You know, to get the job done faster, cheaper, optimal results, because that's what it's all about. 
And that faster, cheaper isn't just cash, it's your time. You know, your time that you could be spending doing something else if this isn't the thing that works. And there'll be many iterations in your value prop. It is worth saying that whilst this is holistically speaking about new projects or new business ideas, this can be absolutely applied to a new proposition with inside your current company. So if you are working currently B2B and you wanted to go to B2C, that is a new proposition. Is that a proposition that you need to do? Well, you need to analyze it. You need to validate it. You need to follow a process much like what we do here. That's the value prop. SMS pitch, just an example here. Like I said, I'm going a little bit deeper on a few things I think are useful. So a high value, uh, high level pitch that summarizes who your customers are, what the outcome you would achieve, what's your secret source. Succinct description of each feature so people can understand exactly what the product does for them. Um, make it about the user and avoid all the fluffy buzzwords. You know, you don't want to be saying, we can, uh, we can revolutionize your financial technology using blockchain and AI because the regular person's going to be like, huh? Whereas if you say, what we can do is make you understand your spending by looking at what you spend and help you plan your finances. Very, very different. So avoid fluffy buzzwords. Think about how you can communicate this as a human because that's ultimately who you're selling to. Uh, six, six description of a model, who you charge, what you charge and how often. We have a simple rate charge. It is X pounds a month at this frequency for this number of people. Just keep things simple. Because when you're asking people to give you information, you've got their time, you've got their attention, and you have to respect that. So you have to make sure that when you're approaching these conversations, you're succinct, you're to the point, you're friendly, you're human, and you make it easy for them to understand what you're trying to do. You know, this isn't about amplifying complexity in the business. This is about making sure it's relatable. So do make sure that that's a key thing that you take to this. Um, building website, Tom's going to touch on this, but there's, there's two things I put in here. Like anybody, I would think on this call with a bit of um, with a bit of time could put together a simple landing page in Wix with a type form. Um, if you can't, obviously there's companies like us that can help, but to be honest, we wouldn't even really touch that because it's, it's not complex enough. So having the tooling and the understanding of how to do a, here's my website, here's my SMS pitch, here's a form to find out more. That is all you really need for this waitlist stage. Okay, moving through to the master plan. So this is, this is kind of like the plan, the gateway to getting excited, uh, investors excited about not just the now, but it's the next and the future. I speak to a lot of founders that say, we are going to be, I don't know, the Uber for donkey rides or whatever it is. And that is all about, we're going we're gonna to completely have all of this market share, but they don't talk about how they get there. And I think that's really, really missed out. And the example that Luis Fabio talked to is Tesla. So the vision is to basically sunset or close down all fossil fuel cars and replace them with sustainable electrical alternatives. That's his vision, right? That's that. But the now, the next and the future is what we're going to offer. The now we're going to build a sports car 10 years ago that's going to rival Ferrari and Porsche. We're going to solve the performance solution because historically everybody thought electric cars were slow. They don't think that now. So that's the now. The next is saying, okay, we want a high-end city car that's got charging networks. So that is the, the biggest selling car in the world now, which is the Tesla 3. And solving the range problem, that's sorting out the battery technology so that we can go more than 30 miles and ensure that the electric cars are practical for long journeys. So he's thinking about, the, um, thinking about how to put in all of the charging stations across the US. So he's gone now, next, and the future. And then he's gone to say, oh, I'm going to offer affordable mid-size car. I'm going to solve the production problem of how we're doing these batteries and he's going to make these cars more affordable. This is a journey that Tesla have gone on that he led with, we're going to sunset the fuel car, fossil fuel car. And I think that's really interesting. So what is your vision? What's your North Star? Brilliant. What's your now? What's your next? And what's your future? And writing that master plan out is it's a, it's a, it's a quite a freeing and exciting experience. Okay, so just some tips and advice on this. So think big, but start small. Like I said, think vision, but go back, dial it back to where you want it, the now, the next, and the, um, and the future to be. Give your vision some credibility. This is key for investors. If you say, I'm going to go and be the biggest ride sharing company in the world straight away, well, how are, you going to, how are you going to convince people that you're going to achieve that vision? What in your story and in your journey has allowed you to say, well, I'm at the now, I've achieved the now, now I can go to the next. So that giving that credibility as you go. There's a great, um, I can't remember where the phrase came from, but it was um, vision without execution is just hallucination. 
And it's very much about that. Don't just say it. You've got to go and do it against the plans because that's what people care about. Um, align expectations with stakeholders at each stage. So you, your team, people who are following you, partners you've got, making sure everybody knows where you're at in your journey. I, I made many mistakes early on in my career where I would talk big picture and then we would just take an age to get there and I'd lose people along the way because they're expecting us to be there when we're really here. So expectation management. Execution focus, I mean, that, that goes without saying. It's on the now, though. Don't focus on the vision piece. Focus on the now, and then you move to the next and then the future. And then you've got to show the investors. Keep people in the loop. Um, if you've got a waiting list, if you've got that plan set, communicate. What are you doing? What are your updates? All of that kind of professionalism of how you talk to your stakeholders, your investors, hugely, hugely important when, when, you're, taking this, when you're taking your businesses forward. Okay, so that was a very, very speedy um, run through um, because I'm mindful of time. But like I say, I will share this, share this deck across. I'll make sure Luke gets it over to everybody. With inside that link, there's a download. Um, you should be able to download that book. If, um, if you don't want to download the book, Who's Fabio's website, which I can also pop on here, will also give some uh, more insight. They sit with inside of our pre-accelerator. So zero to one is a pre-accelerator validation where we take founders through. They're Mahara founders, but it's run by Who's Fabio. And then the piloting stage is what, um, piloting iterating is where Tom comes in. So I'm going to hand over to Tom now, and I've got to get his deck up because I am the man who is doing the button pressing. Yeah, CEO, <coughs> CEO and head of slides. Yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm tired. Oh, we've got it's the most important there. job. Yeah, it is indeed. Okay, right. Are you ready? Right, hi guys. So I'm Tom, and I head up the zero to one department here at Mohara, and that's pretty new as of Jam. We just started, and I mean, we started to we created this thing because it's such an underserved market. There's so much there's, there's less money because investors sort of don't like to play in that area, but it's the most important part of any business everything has to at some point go from zero to one facebook went from zero to one at some point and went on to what it is now it's one of the most important parts of the business so we've created this to to facilitate that so a bit about me i used to run a sportswear business um for a long time and then moved into the tech world which was into vc and then became a freelance venture building venture builder and i helped uh, clients take their ideas and turn them into businesses so i've been around the entrepreneurial circuit for quite a while with the scars to show it and I was always an operator, so got involved with the creation of these things, which is why I loved using no-code tools and still do, because they're just this amazing tool that can help you create your dream in, in a matter of weeks instead of months. So no-code tools are just one of the best suites of tools to get a product to market right now. So this talk, I'm just going to go over... Um, no code mainly in, in the validation. So Rich spoke about validation and waiting lists. So that's how you go out and you prove the market without the need um, to build anything. But then when you go on to build something, you want to build something super simple just to get it out into the hands of your users. And no code is that tool. It's not even about investment. If you have the money, um, you still would do the same thing. You'd still go out, you still build something and learn. And we're at this point now where you know, investors actually see as a bit of a red flag if you're going to raise a pre-seed round just to go on to build an MVP because it's so simple right now to do this stuff. They just, they, it would almost impact ne negatively. So the aim is to, to, for this talk is to go into what is no code? How does it work? What can it do? Some tools you can use and then a bit of knowledge around um, what you need to use it. So Rich, next slide, please. So... Okay. What is no code? So no code refers to a series of tools that give users the ability to build digital products without the need for code. Now, these tools aren't great just because they replace the need to write code. They're great because they are genuinely one of the most effective ways to get a product to market as quick as you can. And it's not the fact that we just love the tools because they're the absence of code. We love them because of the outcome that they provide, that ability to get from zero to one in such a quick way rather than actually hard coding everything. So it's essentially just a shortcut to developing these tech products, getting them out to market. So, I mean, since the, the dawn of technology, products traditionally have been coded by developers and every single line of code has been written. But so if you take a web app, for example, the header, the footers, um, page margins, buttons, dashboards, images, literally everything has been coded in. You know, your code is in this talk, you'll, you'll know this. But if not, like every single thing has to be coded the way it looks, the logic, everything. 
and then linked to a database at the back end if it's data enabled. So it's it's really simple, really com complicated stuff. So everything written in hard code, but now we have no code, and that's exactly what it is. It's it's the ability to create these things that would previously have used code, just without the need for code. And it's a it's a concept that allows individuals and organizations to build these new products in record speeds. And the way that it works is you have pre-made blocks of code that have been written before by the organizations that run the tools, and then you would organize them and using a, a rigid set of guidelines uh, in the forms of input fields. So you have these things that just drag and drop around a page and you're writing the code behind the scenes, but you're just doing it through dragging and dropping. So at the end of the day, it's just a, an advance in a long line of advancements really. Um, when the loom came out, everyone panicked about the weaving industry closing, but actually it just increased productivity and costs were lowered. And that's the same thing that we're seeing um, in no code. Uh, next slide, Rich. So no code is essentially a progression in software development where we're using automation to create code that previously would have needed to be written. The code's there, as I said, it's just hidden away behind the scenes and you, we're using a different methodology to create it. No code is essentially a visual development process and it, because you can just drag and drop things and then assemble them on the screen, you're assembling them in a way that creates a functioning application or workflow. And this has been happening for quite a while. So websites is a great example. We went from HTML to GeoCities, then to WordPress and to Webflow. Um, when we used HTML websites, everything was pure code. Every single thing was built. And then we went to GeoCities, which had a handful of templates, and then you could customize them quite heavily with the HTML. Then we went to WordPress, which was sort of half and half, but it was you could build quite easily a full website without the need for code. And now we're at Webflow, which is one of the most commonly used websites for building websites. And that's like 99, 90 percent no code. We're basically getting there. And the less code that you use, the less labor and the less cost. So the whole industry, everything's getting cheaper and no code is cheaper just because it's less labor intensive, not because it's a lower quality. Uh, next slide, Rich. So I'm just going to go into code versus no code. So this image shows a mobile app. And they're actually the same thing. One on the left, you've got the hard code. And on the right, you've got the no code version. So if, if you're a non-technical founder, it's pretty clear which side you want to be dealing with. You want to be dealing with the nice, good looking one, not the one on the left, which is just all letters and numbers and makes no sense. Well, it makes no sense to me. So, and both of them will end up with the same output, the same thing on the iOS store or the Android store. And on, also one is just so much easier to build. So that's, it's sort of a great way to explain how no code would work in its simplest form, because when you're, you would change something on the, the right hand side, you drag and drop like a button, for example. But if you were to do that through the code, you'd have to go in and find the specific section and change it. One is just so much easier. So you're basically knitting together these pre-made blocks of code visually. Next slide, Rich. So this is another view. So that was using Flutterflow. So this is another view of Flutterflow, which is being built behind the scenes. And this, this time it's a web application, not a mobile application. So the screen in the middle is the design. The component section where you select what you want is on the left. And on the right is the element customization. And if I was going to build a tool, this is exactly how I would do it. So if you wanted to move a box or move something around, you would just click in the middle and, and drag it to the side. Or and if you wanted to change the colors, you would go to the right and you'd change it there. You would, you, you, you have such flexibility in what you want to do. A lot of people say that no code tools are constrained, but when you go to this level, there is there's so much that you can do and there's so much you can create. The limitations are really in your mind, but in terms of what the, the, the tool can produce, there's just so much. And from this view, this is the this is sort of the concept that all no code tools um, tools follow. It's just visual creation. So and if there's one thing that you want to take away from this talk, it's the no code. It's just the organization of pre-made blocks of code. So you are using the code. It's just they're made in a different way. So what no code can do and can't do in terms of functionality, if you wanted to use no code to build like an infinitely scalable platform and that was in like a new line of technology, you'd be disappointed because the databases don't scale too well at such volume. And also in terms of new technologies, because you're stitching together these pre-made blocks of code, it needs to be built before and it needs to be built within the platform. 
But if you want to use no code to build an MVP or get a product that would take you to a pretty decent size revenue um, and using technology that already exists, then it's actually the perfect thing for you to use. Um, a list of examples that I've built, just to give you an overview, um, I built an influencer event app, uh, a marketplace for small business M&A, a mental health therapist marketplace, a cash flow forecasting app, rental uh, a work place, rental marketplace, new site for children, marketplace for information, gift suggestion app, electric vehicle, rent, electric vehicle rental app, and a bridal renting service. So there's a lot that you can do. It's just, you've got to just think about the way to do it. But in terms of production, all those things that I mentioned, they could go onto revenue quite easily and they could scale to tens of thousands of users. But when it just gets to a million, then, then you come to a bit of a problem. So next slide. In terms of tooling, it really does depend on what stage you're at. If you want to build just a landing page and that's it, you'd use a tool such as Framer or Softer. And these things would just spit something out in a day and would get you to the stage that you want to do if it was building a waiting list, for example. But what I'm going to talk about are like the more custom, custom tools, which are a bit more complex, and you can go on to build things. You could potentially build something like Facebook, but never get to the scale that it is. But you could build um, the basics of it. So there are a load of platforms, but the ones that I've chosen on this slide, uh, Airtable, Flutterflow, Bubble, Webflow, Typeform, and Make, the reason I've chosen these ones to talk about is because they're the biggest in terms of revenue, investment, users, staff, and developers, which means that there's just so much of a community out there that you get the support. And also they're probably not gonna fail because the revenue is so high and the investment is so high. So I'm only really gonna go into two, which are the most important ones in my opinion, which are Flutterflow and Bubble. Uh, Flutterflow is ideal for making mobile apps. And that's the one I showed you earlier, Bubble, which is really good at making web apps. Um, so for Flutterflow, Flutterflow, probably is the best one on the market right now because it can build both web apps and mobile apps. So there's anything that you, if there's one that you want to learn, it's Flutterflow right now. It's, um, and some of the weaknesses people go into in no code is the ability to not take the code out afterwards. And with Flutterflow, you can do that. And you do have a lot of flexibility in your builds because you can actually go into the back and change the code. So it's a no code platform. You can build something in full no code if you wanted to, but it has the ability to change it. So it uses the language Flutter, which is a, pop a popular language, which a few of you may know. And yeah, you can build anything and you can edit the code as well. So it's ideal for mobile apps, but it also does well, it's really well as well. And if you want to create web apps, you can use Bubble and Bubble is another great one because it's got such a community behind it that if you ever have any issues, you can find someone that's done it before and they can just tell you what to do. Um, of about 70% of the startups that I've seen, could have been built on either of these tools. Next slide, Rich. So just as no code for validation, no code platforms are pretty much ideal for this because you can easily create something so quickly and there isn't really any more efficient way on the market right now to build a tangible product, take it from idea to tangible product. And you can quickly just build something to quickly create and test the hypothesis of scale. So the go to market is in weeks, not months. And at the end of the day, it's cheaper because less code means less labor and then less cost. So it works out amazing for everyone. And another major benefit is it allows for rapid feedback and iterations. Because once you've got this thing out to market, you can quickly go in and change things as simple as if, if a button's in the wrong place, you just drag it and that will take minutes rather than having to go to a development agency um, or coding it yourself. So, and traditionally pre-seed rounds are used to fund MVPs and the elusive search for product market fit. So you could either give away 10% for 100K to then go on to build the MVP, or you could just build it yourself, go out, build a waiting list, get traction, and then potentially move to revenue yourself. So next slide. Um, this is a bit of a complex one, but it's sort of all of the components behind no code and what you'd need to know if you wanted to go on to build one of these things. So there's three main components to it. There's design, workflows, and database. So design is the way that it would look. You're just putting it together. You don't ever really need to build something that's going to win an award when you're building an MVP. It just needs to not be offensive to the, the customer. And then when you go, then there's workflows afterwards, which are the logic, which is behind. So navigating to different pages, if you're creating data, signing up, showing pop-ups, all of that sort of thing. 
And then you've got databases, which is what the, the, the app will sit on top of. So if you take Facebook, for an example, users will be an input, and then we have messages and posts and all of that sits underneath. So you basically need to learn these things um, in order to build it. And if you're looking at and thinking, why not just use Bubble for, for everything? In some cases, you might not need a database or workflows. Uh, for example, if you were gonna use Webflow, there's no reason why you would um, use, you'd store any data. It's just there to, to as, a, as a nice interactive face. Or if you're gonna use Airtable, for example, or if, if, if you just want to work with data, you'd use Airtable and you wouldn't use a design. So there's all these different tools. You just need to work out which one is the best for you. And if you ask a question later, I can just uh, hopefully let you know. So next slide, Rich. So overall, in summary, no code is just an advancement in a long line of advancements in technology. No code is still based on code. It's just the code is hidden behind the scenes rather than you seeing it. There are a load of platforms out there, but a few key ones to know. And no code is ideal for idea validation. And if you want to become a no coder, there are three things to learn is design, workflows, and databases. So next slide. If there is anything you want to remember from this talk, it's that no code is the organization of pre-made blocks of code that can be structured visually. And at the end of the day, you need to make sure that you build what your customers want rather than what you think they want. And you do that through testing, through getting an MVP and building it. Any questions? Mm -hmm. There's a few, there's eight. Oh, eight. Yeah, yeah let me uh, stop and share. Okay. So, let's have a look see on our chat. Ooh, who wants to facilitate this? I could jump in. Yeah. Firstly, massive well done, Rich and Tom, for getting us through in record time. Incredible. Uh, Hopefully not so too great. <laughs> First one comes through from uh, Lionel on waitlists. So when building a waitlist, mm -hmm. how can a find it, founder mitigate some of the issues around false positives on the actual demand of your product's value, where it may not really translate to a customer demand, but curiosity. So I guess people signing up, but without much intent. I mean, how you typically get away with that is managing that wait list. So when you get someone to sign up, that isn't the end of the job. Uh, that's, the, that's the first indicator that someone's in there. Um, I think the way that you engage with your founders or you could potentially ask them to complete things like forms or you could engage them, talk to them, open, ask open-ended questions that aren't closed where they could say, do you want this? Yes. So what is it about this product that you are interested in? And then actually gauge their interest there. So I think there's a... You've got, you're going to be reaching out and communicating with some of the uh, people with inside your waitlist. So you can't always take the vanity statistic of, yes, there are 3,000 people on there if, um, if you don't think 3,000 people are actually credible or qualified. I think you will get a feeling for that once you engage. Once you engage with your, your, with your waitlist set, it isn't just a number. It, it's that human piece. You've got to go and talk to these people, understand exactly what their problems are, you know, and, and, and get on the phone with 20 of them. Find yeah, a, a while ago, a customer a client came to me and he said he wanted to, he had a long waiting list and he wanted to speak, he wanted to find a way to automate communication with them. And I said, that's the last thing you want to do because you want to speak to these people because you want to go and actually look, look at them face to face and, that, and then ask much deeper questions because that's where you're going to get the true value from this is. And if, the, if it is a false positive, then you'll, you'll learn that straight away and then you, you at least know to get rid of it. You always, you don't want to ask them structured questions. The best way is to just have flowing conversations and then you can like work out the patterns. If you speak to 10 people and they all say the same thing, which isn't within what you ask them anyway, then you know that you've got a feature that you could actually go on to build. It's all about just finding out, just going in with no expectations and learning. I like that. I like the value of yeah, jumping into the conversation too. To, yeah always to, to know who these and it's, it's lazy to just send out mass surveys you really want to get to know your customers because if you get to know a customer who who can offer you value in your build well then you might have a customer there um, a potential customer to actually go on to buy it so you build that relationship so you should always be speaking to these people it's uh you're spending all this time building a business you should really spend time actually working out what the problem is and who your customers are you'll create a saving down the road for sure. 
Another one from Lionel. Uh, so say the validation has an element of competitive advantage where first to market is key. Would you still advise for a waiting list? So maybe Rich, what, 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 are, you, what are your thoughts on the importance of being first to market? Do you mean in terms of being stealthy and not exposing what the opportunity is? is that is that the question? Lionel, what would you say? Is that kind of yeah? I would. I, I yeah. My thinking is if it's something like super low key and there's a lot of value. Maybe you see it like there's a huge value in it, and it can be usurped by somebody um, or stolen. Uh, the idea basically because you're putting it out there. Um, not saying it's a novel idea, but it's something that can be taken over by somebody else and then they just go with it. So your waiting list has sort of put you at a disadvantage now because somebody else can start um, executing on it and building that market share. I would always be worried right? because there's first <laughs> mover advantage, but there's also second mover and third mover. So you could always say that if someone else took your idea, they would figure out all the problems for you. So it's, it's not really too much of a negative, but it's always it's always good to... I mean, just keep it private then, because the people that you're speaking to, they aren't the ones that would steal your idea anyway. But it's, it doesn't, it's, it's, you always want to get that validation. You obviously can do it, but it's validation is, is more important. And, and you always got to think about people aren't, will someone actually go out and build that idea? It's highly unlikely that they will. Everyone thinks their idea, you know, is this game changing thing that someone will steal. But in reality, a lot of people don't have a lot of time to go and do it. It's a valid concern, but I wouldn't be too worried about it. Yeah, I think I think Lionel, to be honest, in, the, in those situations, I I understand the fear around the anxiety around. Well, I don't want to say this in case X company with these resources could pivot and make something. Um, there's a there's a there's a discovery element to it to begin with. Are you going to be discovered? Is that page going to be discovered in this first place? You know, you're not going to get the level of exposure to be probably able to get any market penetration at this point, really. And also to Tom's point, you know, an idea is an idea. You know, many the amount of the amount of people that have come to us to talk about doing niche marketplaces around the fitness industry, and have only seen one of them be successful, and there must have been thirty. So it's not just about the idea, it's about how you execute, how you validate, how you actually talk to and understand your market. So I would be confident enough to put it out there if it were me. If you want to keep it quiet and you want to invite people to sessions with you, it's a longer way around. Um, but that does allow you to be that little more under the radar stuff if you feel comfortable. It depends upon what the idea is. If it's like a, a Facebook or a marketplace for X, then it probably has been done before. But if it's like something really novel in cybersecurity, then yeah, you, that, that is a different case. Then you probably yeah. don't want to. So it all depends upon what it is. Good question, Elon. And I understand right. the anxiety around it. Get it. <laughs> sure. Th thanks for your response. Great. This next one's from Kipto. Kipto, if, you, if you're still... Yes, I see you on. Um, I might ask you to come off mute to give us a bit of understanding around maybe what you're building, if you are keen for that. The question is, uh, at Tom, what would you use to build medium to high complexity SaaS tools? So our team has struggled to find no-code builders that achieve the right balance of pricing, flexibility, versioning, community support, especially for customer-facing B2B SaaS apps. Sure. I mean, it depends upon how far you want to go with it, really. Uh, could yeah, you, could you, could you, you keen to... Are you keen to, to add some color? Add some more to it? Well, I can just cover it anyway. It depends on how far you want to go. Um, if you're building something really complex, then there are bigger um, tools like Mendix that you could go to and you have specialized builders that will work in teams. But the beauty of these um, no-code platforms is you can get one developer to go on to build and they don't need to, to work with anyone else. You can create some pretty complicated stuff with with the tools, and I'd say Flutterflow is probably the best one, just because you can export the code and you can go in and you could, you know, add in whatever you wanted to. So Flutterflow is the way the way for that one. Um, but it, yeah, it just depends on how far you want to go with it. If you're looking to build something high, highly complex, I would say build an MVP on no code to prove it, and then you know once you've proven that it works, you can just go onto custom code. No code isn't the answer to everything. Um, I've seen a lot of tools now. Um, that actually you, you couldn't build on no code just because of the complexity, because of the features, because of the need to tie everything together. Yeah. So no code isn't always the answer. 
but it's great at the beginning in the zero to one stage. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I just wanted to add some context uh, to oh, my sure. question. Um, we we operate in the logistics uh, space, and we have seen a great diversity of problems. Um, yeah, we've seen a uh, a good amount of um, uh, divergent problems that you know could arguably you know lead to different solutions uh, across different use cases in in the logistics um, space, so from first mid mile to last mile. Um, yeah, so one of our problems is that, you know, we, we we haven't yet determined what the sweet spot is, like what the ultimate SaaS solution uh, could look like. Um, and so our MVP has, you know, is kind of like a hodgepodge of different solutions. Um, and they are deferring uh, automations, uh, that solve different problems. So uh, you end up having a really complicated product. Uh, partly, I guess, those, because, yeah. yeah, in some ways, we skipped the waitlist uh, uh, wait listing step, uh, you know, uh, talking to each customer in a, um, in a kind of a bespoke way. Mm -hmm. So that, that's why I'm asking that. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, the, the last thing you want to do is build something complicated without speaking to customers. So just speak to a few and see what they want. And when you're building, you should always focus on this is just boring building theory. Just build or build one thing. It's called land and expand. Build one thing, build that well, and then build the um, build the features on later. I've seen some horrible no code tools, which are still no code, but you've you tie together five different softwares, and they just become so complex, and they all rely on each other. And then if you get to the point where that scales, then you've got no one that's going to understand what you've done. So it just becomes a very, very complicated thing. So yes, it's cheaper, but be wary that you might create a monster. So I would stick to one platform if you can. And the platform is, is usually Butterfly because it can do web apps and mobile apps, and it has the ability to use external databases and you can export the code. That's, that's what I would say. But if you want any more questions, just like DM me on in, in, um, LinkedIn and I'll, I can answer them all for you. We can get specific if you want. If, if yeah, there are any totally. other questions, Sounds good. Thanks. If there are any other questions from anyone, um, please put them in the chat or, or raise a hand. Kipto, you I, I looked it up now. You're working on uh carpooling, right? No, uh, well now um uh, dispatch management software and inventory management for e-commerce brands. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot going on in that market. I can see why you have a lot of a lot of features. Yeah, in a way, it's a mess, but uh, you make a good point about, uh, uh, you know, starting with one thing um, and, and with logistics, I mean, there's, there's many different problems typically to be solved at once. That's why um, uh, it's, it's been a challenge for us. Now it's the but challenge of being an entrepreneur. You see so many of these opportunities, but if you look at, I, I don't know, you start with one product, there's so many avenues you can go down. But if you focus on that one thing, it's probably like a multi-billion dollar market. But as an entrepreneur, you always want to create and innovate and, and go off on a tangent. But it's always about going back to that one thing. Yep, yep, 100%. Any other questions? Yeah, um, my last question. Um, it's just, again, back to the uh, wait list. Is there any recommended uh, time, what is it called? any recommended duration that you should stay in a wait list um, mm -hmm. or have a wait list that's going on uh, mm -hmm. versus between having a wait list and then seeing this traction and value which is coming along and then yeah. saying oh it's lasting too long it can last a yeah. year or mm -hmm. is there a certain you know sweet spot of period and then yeah. should you also be in parallel working with your mvp so so we wouldn't recommend going to the pilot MVP until you've got indications that that's what you should be building because you're only, you're only going to put, you know, you're going to spend time on something that you may completely pivot and change. So the period of time that we typically see, and I know from JP and Darren who run, who's Fabio's time, is that that kind of like onboarding into the journey, completing the waitlist section, the SMS pitch, doing the master plan, that's about six to eight weeks. 
you know, and that's where you're kind of talking to market, you're understanding, you're refining. And then at about the six, about the six, six, seven, eight week mark is when you start to plan pilot. So you're looking at that kind of end to end, it's about about three months. You know, if you're coupling the, you know, the iterate, the, the, the validate, you know, working on the validation of those parts, the pilot and getting something into markets about two to three months. And then you've got your iteration because we know that, you know, the first thing you put out there is going to need changing. So, you know, you will. So there's a period of time where you iterate as well. Um, so, yeah, but roughly about that time period. The Who's Valve book's okay. free, isn't it? I believe it is now, yes. So the Who's Valve book covers all of this in like really good detail, like generally really good business theory on how to do it, like at every single step. So, yeah, I'm sure we could send that out afterwards because that will answer that question and it will, yeah, it's just an amazing read. Yeah. Okay. And uh, definitely, and, and, and you know, we, we're close partners with them. So you can find, you know, you can reach out LinkedIn. I can point in the same direction. We can talk about if there's something you're interested in about how we could line that up. Right. And also in, in the weight listing aspect of it, is it now you're going to have to find your audience um, somehow? So you also have to have some sort of marketing budget, right? I mean, you do it yourself typically. Yeah, I so always say food. if you're starting a business in that arena, it sort of proves your capability to go out and find those users because it's great to have the waiting list, but you also will need to go to sell this thing at some point. So work out the channel that you're going to go down and yeah, basically you're proving, proving yourself really. So you should never get anyone else to do it. And if, if Facebook ads is the way and it works, because you can always test these things. If Facebook ad works, you've also sort of found a channel that you can go sell. On. Right. Right. Um, I'm just mindful of these last two questions. I just want to be really quick. Any thoughts on how to transition from no code to in-house? Um, so it's in not just no that, code developer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's there's many there's many different parallels there. I mean, if, parallel journeys. If you build no code and you want to go from an external partner to an internal partner, you recruit. You know, and it's standardized tooling. The actual transition from outsource, if you will, to insource is easier than it would be in traditional code because of that standardization. Um, if you're looking at, if you're looking at going from no code to full code, if there's an element of scale, um, I think, you know, that comes with funding typically, and it's a slightly larger question about what you actually really want. And is it a hybrid solution where part no code, part full code? But I think the, from an outsource provider to kick you off, to get someone internally, I think it's not frictionless, but definitely less scary than if you're doing it in full code. Yeah, it's it's tough, but I always say to this question, once you if you go through the process of building something on no code and then iterating it and validating it, you have got this amazing thing that you've built that you can just show to a, a developer and they can then go on to build it. So it's just, you've done all of the work already. Or if you build on Flutterflow, you can just export the code. And then just product manager, chiming in um so i would also kind of set up maybe a cadence of if you are looking to transition from external to maybe even internal no code builder yeah or, or code builder um then have some kind of cadence where you check in with the with the external builder and just you know be sure that they are um doing some form of documentation because if you do hire someone internally and they are they're, they're being handed something to continue working off of uh, then I think it really helps to be able to understand what was the thinking of the previous person who put this together. And that helps them know how to add on to it. Mm. Yeah, there's a lot of bubble developers out there. The, the, the good ones are hard to find, but you can just bring them in, in house. I mean, we as a service actually provide, we send out bubble developers and we find the good ones. So that's always possible as well. Um, the last question, I guess, moving from pre-seed to seed stages, it's critical to scale. Yeah. Um, when you use things like bubble, for example, they don't scale too well. Um, but if you were to use something like, that would, you can link to external databases and typically the database is where it struggles. But again, like once you start scaling, you've actually proven the concept and then it's time to start thinking about the next step. Yep. Once like if viewing no code tools as this way to just get build a platform cheaply isn't the best way to do it you want to to use it to test the concept 
and then you have something you can go on to raise. You can use MVP, like investors want MVPs to just to, to view traction. And then you also have this thing that you can show um, a developer. So you're saving money. So you prove the concept and save some cash along the way. So if you're getting to scaling, um, then then great. That's a really good thing. And if you break the platform because you've got too many users, that's not an issue. Like that's a really good thing. But also you probably should have planned ahead for that. <laughs> yeah, well, well done you, but also slap on the wrist. Yeah, yeah <laughs> if, if it looks like it's struggling, then you know, start, start looking at no uh, at code or go and raise yeah. some money. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. This has been an awesome session. Uh, thank you again, Shamsad and Namara for uh, for pulling this together and, and bringing us in with, with this network. We really enjoyed it. And um, thank sure. you to everyone for tuning in. If anyone's got any questions about no code, uh, send me a message on LinkedIn. And it's always good to get really specific about what your, your product is. It's really hard on these calls for me to give out too much information. But if you've got specific questions about what you want to create on no code, I'm more than happy to just uh, have a chat or a call or something to go into it. Super. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Really good thank time. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you, thank you so much, Richard. Tom, Look, really nice to meet you. Great uh, insightful session. And for everyone else, we'll send a need to like learn contact tom or richard uh yeah we'll send a follow-up email with that all that stuff thank you so much guys this is really thank you. great and, uh, thanks guys yeah Bye looking now. forward to all right have a good one take care yes.